A Brief Account of the Life of Phineas Taylor Barnum, published in 1909. Few men were better known or more admired by the children than Phineas Taylor Barnum. Barnum always insisted that he inherited not only the name, but the characteristics of Phineas Taylor, his mother's father. At any rate, he was the pet of all his grandfather when a child and from con <coughs> constant association absorbed a great many of his ideas. His father was Phi Philo Barnum, a son of Captain Ephraim Barnum. Phineas Taylor Barnum was born the day after the 4th of July, 1810. His father was a farmer and tavern keeper, as well as a tailor for some of his neighbors. Barnum had but little opportunity to get an education. His schooling was going a uh, little beyond the, the uh, country district school. Barnum's first visit to New York, to New York now New York City, was made in 1822. He went to help drive a bunch of cattle arriving there four days later, having tramped all the way through a heavy snow. After an eventful week in New York, he returned home, even then determined to make New York City his future home. He later worked in a country store for a time um, on a percentage basis and made money. In the fall of 1826, Barnum was offered a job as clerk in a grocery store in Brooklyn, which he accepted. At this time, he became dissatisfied with the idea of working for a fixed salary. He could only see a future independence for himself and some plan whereby he would get full pay for all that he would do, and he allowed and was allowed to do all that he could. In February 1828, he returned to Bethel and started a retail fruit and confectionery store, buying his goods from New York City, starting the business with a capital of $120, which he had saved. In 1831, he commenced the publication of the Herald of Freedom, a weekly newspaper. Almost as soon as he started the paper, he was overwhelmed with suits for libel and finally was convicted and sentenced to 60 days in the county jail for an attack in his columns on a certain church deacon who had been guilty of taking usury of an orphan boy. His release from prison was celebrated by the whole population for miles around and by a banquet at which several hundreds of his friends were present. He was driven in a coach drawn by six horses and accompanied by a band of music. The coach was preceded by forty horsemen, and this was Barnum's first introduction to a street parade, which had a great influence on his later life. In 1835, he moved to New York, and from that time on, New York can be considered his home. He began his career as a showman by purchasing Aunt Joyce Heath, a Negro woman supposed to be 161 years old, formerly the property of General George Washington's father. He exhibited <clears throat> the woman in New York at Niblo's Garden, and she was supposed to be the uh, nurse who first dressed the infant George Washington. The most remarkable thing about Mr. Barnum's career was that he, in a whole in part, originated every vocation which which he ever followed. His method of running a fruit and candy store was his own. His plan of running a newspaper was his own. And later, the show business, as he conducted it, was entirely, or was an entire novelty, which he created by himself. In 1841, he opened a general store for a certain edition of the Bible, um, conducting the business for about a year and selling um, and selling thousands upon thousands of Bibles, but not uh, finally making a very large profit. This was the last step aside from the show business, to which he then returned and to which he gave the balance of his life. Barnum was, Barnum was presented with a five-acre tract known as Ivy Island by his grandfather, and when it came to purchase of Sh um, Scooter's American Museum, he scheduled this property as security for the unpaid portion of the purchase price which was $12,000. Immediately after the purchase of the uh, museum began Barnum's real business career. He had bought the museum largely on credit and, as he expressed it, it was a fight for life. He began the conduct of the museum in 1841 naming it Barnum's American Museum and began what was perhaps the most sensational advertising campaign ever conducted. Mr. Barnum's financial fortune was already well started, but his discovery of Charles S. Stratton, whom he rechristened General Tom Thumb, was perhaps the most potent influence in his later money-making career. 
He paid Charlie, who was only, who was then only five years of age, seven dollars and fifty cents per week, but a short time after increased his salary to twenty-five dollars. Mr. Barnum later discovered Jenny Lind, the Swedish nightingale, and managed her, her concert tour in America, paying her a salary of one thousand dollars per concert, and at the same time netting himself as high as ten thousand to twenty thousand dollars per night. $10,000 of the receipts for the first concert were given to charity, and the receipts for the next concert were divided equally between Mr. Barnum and Miss Lind. Mr. Barnum seldom appeared on stage or rostrum, but in 1852 he spent several months delivering temperance lectures throughout the state of Connecticut. And while as in New York and Pennsylvania, he was an ardent prohibitionist and could always draw a large audience. The later years of Mr. Barnum's life were spent at his Oriental Villa near Bridgeport, Connecticut. Here, his four daughters paid him many visits and maternally brightened his last years. He died in 1891, having lived an eventful, busy, and yet withal careful life.